Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy, and we pray, Lord, you may bind us together as a family. Help us, Father, to recognize our purpose as a church. Help us to recognize our purpose as your people, Lord, and help us, Lord, to receive your love this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The reason I chose Malachi chapter 2 to open the sermon is because it ends saying God hates, what does he hate? What does it say he hates specifically? It says he hates putting away. It says God hates divorce. I don't know if you were following the passage. Because this is the binding unit of society. God's goal, when he said the two shall become one flesh. What was the goal in the verses that were read? It says, wherefore did he make one? Verse 15 of Malachi chapter 2. Why did he make the two become one flesh? It says that he might seek a godly seed. So if we look at society, do we see godly youth, godly children, godly families? Or do we see a drifting away from that? And so if we see that the youth are not godly, the children are not godly, what is the problem according to that verse? Marriage. Family unit, the binding house band, mother, husband, and wife are the binding unit of the family. So if we find that youth are not the godly seed God is seeking for, it's because there's an issue between the mother and the father in the families. And do we see a rise in broken families, a rise in divorce? Absolutely. 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 So even without statistics, based on that verse, we can conclude the reason there is a rise in teenage crime, teen pregnancy, binge drinking, is because of what? A breakdown in the family. A breakdown in the family. And we don't need to be theologians to deduce that. Now... This one, I just want to emphasize that this choir group, for me, when I sit in my house and I hear them going on, what I find most important about it, to me, is not even the singing. It's because it has become a safe haven, a place of comfort, of Christian community. For these girls, I hear them laughing and joking and bonding. And if you read this verse, it says, Christian sociability is altogether too little cultivated by God's people. Those who shut themselves up within themselves, who are unwilling to be drawn upon to bless others by friendly association. Not by preaching, just by company. Just by company, lose many blessings. For by mutual contact, minds receive polish and refinement. By social intercourse, Acquaintances are formed and friendships contracted, which result in a unity of heart, an atmosphere of, of love, which is pleasing in the sight of heaven. So I just want to say I love that gathering. For me, it's a youth group more than it is a choir. And I really appreciate it, and I hope that God may continue to encourage you guys to keep doing what you're doing because I see a big change in many of the girls that are in there. So, God bless you for your efforts. All right. I've entitled this sermon, Our Greatest Need. Our Greatest Need. And I feel God has been speaking to me and it was amazing when I met up with Natham. He affirmed what God was confirming to me. And uh, we had a really good time talking about it. We really did. All right, here we are. Okay. 
Society is composed of families. I've said this so many times already. And is what the, he and it, and is what the heads of families make it. Out of the heart are the issues of life. And the heart of the community, of the church, of the nation is the household. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influences. You would never think that far ahead. But everything that makes New Zealand what New Zealand is rests upon the fabric of the family unit. The influence of a carefully guarded Christian home in the years of childhood and youth is the surest safeguard against the corruptions of the world. In the atmosphere of such a home, the children will learn to love both their earthly parents and their heavenly father. What is the greatest lesson to be learned during our time on earth? How to love one another. That quote ends saying, they will love both their earthly parents and their heavenly father. How can we be certain of what the greatest lesson to be learned is? Hmm? What is the greatest commandment in all the Bible? Love God and love your neighbor. That is the greatest lesson to be learned on planet earth. And what is the best school for that lesson to be learned? What is the best school for that lesson? The home, yeah. The home is the best school for the lesson of loving God and loving man. The best way to educate children to respect their father and mother is to give them the opportunity of seeing the father offering kindly attentions to the mother and the mother rendering respect and reverence to the father. It is by beholding love in their parents that children are led to obey the fifth commandment and to heed the injunction, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. It is right. Now what I have prepared is a video, and it's a lengthy video, but it's going to only be played today, and the rest of the month is going to be based on this video. So it's 10 minutes long, and I hope you can sit back, tune in, and this is just painting a picture of what the New Zealand reality is. And we will build into our sermon from there. Family First New Zealand has been speaking up for 10 years on issues that matter to your family. Here's a summary of just some of the many topics we've spoken about. The lobby group Family First is furious at this week's planned launch of the violent video game Grand Theft Auto. The game, among other things, allows players to buy cocaine, run over civilians in cars and shoot police officers. Uniforms aren't the only talking point. The guidelines also suggest addressing gender stereotypes and norms in school years one to three. Primary school kids are not thinking about gender identity and gender norms. The Advertising Standards Authority has banned an internet mana party video that includes crowds chanting expletives aimed at the Prime Minister. Family First complained about the video which was posted on YouTube but was classed in Adver advertisement for internet mana. Family First has been fighting the law since its 2007 inception. It's now armed with a legal opinion from public lawyer May Chen, saying good parents are being criminalised. Their faces are becoming familiar, and the reaction of horror is always the same. Now campaigners want everyday people to stand up and be counted. 
But some see the idea of a kid's hotel as a convenient way out for parents who put their own lives or career first. If Johnny turns up to school deciding that he wants to be a girl for that day, does that mean that he uses the girls' toilets, he changes with the girls before PE, and he plays in the girls' soccer team? That's, that's a recipe for a confusion. It is five to seven. I wonder if the kids have already got their heads down onto iPads and iPods and the rest of it this morning, because your children apparently are risking their health by spending too much time glued to TVs and devices. Well, that's the claim in a new report by a Family Values Lobby Group. Family First says the court's decision is a disgrace. We have deemed in our legal system that the right of the pornography industry to advertise on a main street is more important than the right of families to be protected. Family breakdown and decreasing marriage rates are costing New Zealand taxpayers at least $1 billion. A new report commissioned by Family First shows even a small reduction in the family breakdown and increase in marriage rates could mean a significant savings for taxpayers. It's the flick that's been billed as a supernatural tale of mental illness, bondage, incest, revenge and explicit graphic violence. Not exactly family viewing, right? Well, definitely not, says Family First. They've already called for the film Wound to be banned. But Family First New Zealand, which advocates for strong families and safe communities, says there is no place for topless sunbathing on our public beaches. I think it's totally wrong to do that. What about the calls from uh, Family First, which have come out this morning from Bob McCroskery, about the right to silence law? But first, sex in school. We go back to the classroom to learn what kids are learning about sex. We're just saying, hey, look, it's just a physical act. As long as you wear the condom, you can basically get away with anything. Because there are parts of it, I mean, we're talking sex, violence, drugs, aren't Ex we? Explicit, but though, and I'd like to read extracts from the book to you, but we can't on air. really says to our young people is that you're rich, you're famous, you can get away with anything. E kōreroana a Bevadea Bates mō te tono a Chris Brown ki te uru mai ki au te aroa. Unfortunately, in terms of the, some of the nasty things on the internet, the horse has bolted, unfortunately, and so it's putting some safeguards in place. So discuss it with your kids. If they do come across some of this dodgy stuff, talk about it. I, I don't think we can avoid it anymore because it is, it's just the nature of the internet now. If we really worked hard to make this a family event, this is not an angry march. This is not a group of people who are angry. We just want democracy, don't we? Because we love our kids. We love our families. It's almost four years since babies Chris and crew Kahui were killed. Now Family First says an anonymous donor has offered $25,000 to see justice served. Hi there, I'm Simon Barnett and a very proud dad of four beautiful girls. In the next 90 seconds, let me explain to you what the referendum on the anti-smacking law is all about. Joining me now is Bob McCoskery uh, from Family First in the studio and women's health doctor Carol Shand. One, two, three, four, go Others were outraged. One, two, three, A lobby group gathered 300,000 signatures which forced the citizens referendum. I want to know why the law and why people aren't going over the real perpetrators like the, with um, Nia Glassie and coral burrows and, um, and the Kahui twins. We've now got a number of things kicking in. We've got uh, increased uh, mortgage rates. We've got GST yep, uh, yep. kicking in shortly. Family First have um, released a survey. It's called Young People and Alcohol, and of course the, the, the alcohol reform bill is, is something that's going to be kicking over this mm. year. A lobby group Family First is urging the government to vote against the marriage amendment bill that would allow gay marriage. At a parliamentary select committee hearing today, the group presented a petition with more than 70,000 and signatures of people who want marriage to remain between a man and a woman. If you change the definition, and this is a question I want to ask Louisa, is once you change the definition once, what stops you changing it again? I mean, if you, you, don't, if you take away the regulation of gender, why not the regulation of, of number? Groups from the other side would say that you just don't understand child poverty, you don't understand inequality, you've forgotten what it's like to be poor, yep. you live in Parnell, yep. you know, have you forgotten? No. The argument is once you redefine something, where do you stop? I mean, what's wrong with three consenting adults who want to get married, or four? When Family First launched a Protect Marriage website today, the website was attacked by hackers, it's still down, and its creator received nearly 100 hate emails. You're back with Q&A and uh, the panel, Raymond Miller, Bob McCroskey and Anton Blunk. Gay adoption, 
Uh, no, because I think a child right, deserves Miller. a mum and a dad. A divorce made easy website has been launched today. The site says it can help reduce the cost of a marriage breakup. It says there's no need for sizeable legal fees or solicitors dragging out the divorce process. The Christian lobby group Family First says the concept is both tacky and destructive. Well, they are confused. I mean, uh, what that question actually showed was that 3% couldn't figure out what the agenda was. And I think most people would raise their eyebrows and say, well, surely you know what your biological sex is. Joining me now is Dr. Miriam Grossman, a psychiatrist from the States who writes about the harm of sex education. She's been brought out here by Family First. I don't think the question is, uh, when do we begin sexuality education? The actual question is who does a sexuality education? So you agree that it should start when kids are five? No, my argument is simply that parents determine what kids need to know at the suitable times. And when does a child, unborn child have a right to life? At what point in their life? Well, it's being biologically, life begins from the very start. Conception? Yeah. Uh, if I send my child to school and they've got different shoes to what the school says or, or they want to go on a trip to the zoo, I've got to sign a note. But when it comes down to a serious medical procedure like an abortion or what to do with an unwanted pregnancy, suddenly I can be excluded from that situation and my child can be sneaked off. I'm on Guy Island's team and I need you to vote for us because we need to equip and encourage parents to step up to the mark and be the best parents they can in New Zealand. And I think job description 101 for parents is a roof, a shelter for your kids, and food for your kids. All right, very powerful stuff. Thanks very much, Bob. Family First's making no apologies for a report that claims too many New Zealand children are spending too long in daycare. The Family First organisation says there have been 10 suspicious child deaths in the past 17 months. That's these seven children and three other newborns. That's why we want an independent watchdog, because I think when social workers are making crucial decisions, uh, often subjective judgments based on the information at hand, then they need a independent watchdog that ratifies what they've done, gives the public confidence. Family First says it's written to New Zealand booksellers asking them to steer clear of the title. But what these groups are doing is shutting down any image of a father feeding a child, and I think that's a great image that we need on TV, at the same time as saying, breast is best. She'll vote next month at the local church where she still teaches Bible class. Education she she says is vital and it leaves no excuse for young people not to vote. Hi, so meet New Zealand's longest married couple, um, Jerem and Gunja Ravji, have been married for 81 years. 81. What is the purpose of adoption? Okay, let me ask you a specific and I'm question, there are Bob. There plenty of children that need love and we shouldn't Yeah, and they also who's need gender complementarity. They want the mum and the dad. Family First is this morning publishing legal advice around catering for transgender students at school. The lobby group claims schools are being bullied into adopting gender identity policies and they need guidance. I mean, I, I can't imagine anyone seriously thought that was going to help this problem that we've got with child abuse. Uh, Bob, thank you very much for joining us. Bob McCoskey, sorry. Uh, Family First New Zealand National Director. Uh, and the figures are there. They're Andy smacking law, complete, complete waste of time. <laughs> Join our campaign to protect families. Be informed, be equipped to speak up. Support this important work. Visit familyfirst.nz. I am endorsing Family First because I really think that they're a voice that is making a difference. And I think that that's the voice the church should have in New Zealand society on all those issues and this is society today, just based on New Zealand in the last 10 years, these were the issues mentioned in that video. Video game crime, alcohol, gender issues, profanity, anti-smacking, bad parenting, media abuse, pornography, family breakdown, inappropriate TV content, public nudity, protecting criminals, uh, distorted sex education, the list goes on. That's New Zealand society today. Now, I want to take you to the Bible just to have a reflection on this, because there, there's more. I mean, they didn't even mention suicide, euthanasia, bullying, uh, sickness, gambling, prostitution. The list goes on of issues that are totally current. And I want to say that they're symptoms of something bigger. Now, this is the Bible, and this is what the Bible says the church 
is going through. This is what the church is dealing with today. It says, men will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, disobedient to parents. Do you see a correlation with the, the list before? Ungrateful, unholy, that spells out a big list of uh, immorality that you can put in the unholy section. If you read the reference verse there, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, unloving, unforgiving, false accusers, without self-control, violent, abusive, despisers of good people, backstabbers, daring, impulsive, reckless, big-headed, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, right? Fake, hypocritical, lukewarm, the Bible says. So you take a, a sample of New Zealand society in the last 10 years, and Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy, and you unpack it, and you see everything that was written by Paul is exactly what we're dealing with. And the heart of the issue the heart of the issue is the breakdown of family. Now, this was an article written recently because the reference is the royal wedding. We should be concerned that marriage rates are at an all-time low. The weakening of marriage is one of the most important social issues we are facing. The declining marriage rate is a disturbing link to social problems in our society, including the risk of child abuse, domestic violence, teen crime, and child poverty. Another one. According to an article, why, uh, well, um, a, a report, Why Marriage Matters, by 13 leading social science scholars, including Professor William Galston, a domestic policy advisor to the Clinton administration, parental divorce or non-marriage appears to increase children's risk of school failure, the risk of suicide, psychological distress, and most significantly, delinquent and criminal behavior. And then I've got a quote from Adventist Home. Just to relate Bob McCroskey's uh, statements to Adventist Home, it says, marriage is honorable. It was one of the first gifts of God to man. It is one of the two institutions that after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. When the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, marriage is a blessing. It guards, this is a beautiful part, it guards the purity and happiness of, of the race. That transcends Christian, transcends Hindu. It guards the purity and happiness of the race as a whole, the human race. It provides for man's social needs, or should. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. Marriage. Now I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to read a few verses here. And, and I, I want you to, to digest the point as we progress I'm in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to jump over to Matthew chapter 5, as I'm building on this concept, and I know you get it, I really know you get it, you grasp it, I'm going to read verse 31, and then I'm going to go to Matthew 19. It says, it has been said, whoever shall put away his wife, because now I want to give you insight into why Jesus was so strong on the issue. Why was he so unwavering? It says, it has been said, whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorce. But I say to you that whoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. Very strong statement. Why? Because once the family begins to break down. What happens? There is a ripple effect through all of society. That's the idea. And I want to build on this in Matthew 19 because having said this, a Pharisee then comes wanting to challenge Jesus in Matthew 19. I'm going to read from verse 3. 
he comes to him and wanting to challenge him, he says, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, why did Moses then command that we should give a writing of divorce to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. And whoso marries her which is put away, commits adultery. I'm not going to explain that text. I read it for what it says, and you take it for what it says. All I'm going to say is, think about the big picture of society. All the list of issues we watched in that video are all boiling down to what? The family. All of that. All of that whole list. A breakdown in the family. In Isaiah, maybe you don't have to go there. Chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says that a home, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing from the text. I'm not quoting it literally, home is a place of defense, right? It's a place of defense, a place of rest, a place of refuge. When you think about home after a hard day's work, right? Most people think about it this way. I just want to get home and, and relax, right? Have a nap. You know, that's the idea of home. But for some today, when you're going home, you're actually starting to brace yourself because the battle begins when you get home. It's not a place of relief, a place of release, a place of rest, of refuge, of defense. I've got a quote here. The principle incul inculcated by the injunction, big words, be kindly a affectioned one to another, lies at the very foundation of domestic happiness. Christian courtesy should reign in every household. It is cheap, but it has, it has power to soften natures which would grow hard and rough without it. The cultivation of uniform courtesy, a willingness to do by others as we would like them to do by us, would banish half the ills of life, right? Half of the things that depress society would be taken away if home was a place of happiness. A place of happiness. Husbands, please bear with me. I'm just trying to be honest, and I hope you can be honest with me. Husbands, are you dissatisfied? And this should not be taken personal. Are you dissatisfied with your wives? The reason divorce is because there's dissatisfaction on both ends. Husbands, are you dissatisfied with your wives? Are they constantly nagging, contentious, angry? Are you worried she's gaining too much weight? Are you worried that there's no more intimacy? She doesn't know how to cook, clean, or to look after the children? She spends too much money. She's very bossy. There's always issues in marriage, and each time, if you Google this, you will find an endless list of complaints by husbands to wives. And guess what the Bible says as a solution? It says, husbands, if you want to fix your wife, love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. It says, Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, it says, he loved her and gave himself for her. For what purpose? That he might 
Anyone know? Sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such kind of thing. In other words, by love, all the issues you have with your wife will be cleansed. They will be gone. Isn't that amazing? Wives, you'll have a perfect wife, I guarantee you. And I'm working on it. <laughs> Wives, are you tired of the indifferent, the violence, the neglect of family time, too much time spent at work, always staring at other women, drinking too much, cares more about his car than you, spends more time watching rugby than paying you some attention, lazy, vindictive, controlling, overbearing. All he wants is intimacy, overweight. Guess what the Bible says is a solution? It says, 1 Peter chapter 3, wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. I'm just reading scripture. Be in subjection to your own husbands that if any have all those qualities that you hate, it says, if any obey not the word, that they also may without the word be won by the conduct, by the love and humility of their wives. If you respond to this biblical instruction, wives, you will have yourself the perfect man. I'm telling you. And my wife's working on that too. I want you, we're going to zone in on this. Parents, give your children love. Love in babyhood, love in childhood, love in youth. Do not give them frowns, but ever keep a sunshiny countenance. Help your children to gain victories. They're tempted on every side. They're struggling with sin. Surround them with an atmosphere of of love. Thus, you can subdue their stubborn dispositions. You cannot beat it out of them. It has to be correction through love. Discipline through love. The Bible says, is not life more than food or the body more than Clothes. When I was growing up, I was told, well, I feed you, I buy you clothes. The Bible says life needs more than I feed you, parents. Life needs more than I buy you clothes. I put a roof over your head. The Bible says life is more than that. Children need more than that. The greatest human need, as we said earlier, is more than food and clothing. Christian parents, Christian men and women, boys and girls, do not, this is an instruction, do not prioritize what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will put on. Even more important than your house, your mortgage, your car, your fashion, your food is the kingdom of God. And the Bible says this, and I never read it in this light before. It says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says, drawing on what is the kingdom of God, seek ye first the kingdom of God. It says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Right? It is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
Don't be satisfied if they know the whole periodic table of elements, if they've memorized the whole human anatomy, if they know all about World War I and World War II. Do not be satisfied. Sending them to school, providing food, shelter, and clothing will not get them into the kingdom of God. It will not. The Bible says, challenging us, it says, do not the publicans do the same? Do they not clothe their children, feed them, put a roof over their heads? Do they not? Do they not send them to school? And Christ challenges us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 47. He says, we need to do more than everybody else. Have you read that before? He says, we need to do more than everybody else. Because we are raising children for the kingdom. So if the world clothes them, feeds them, puts shelter, sends them to school, we have to recognize that we have to do more to get them into the kingdom of God. We have to do more. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, parents, families, Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves of mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that whole list of things happening in New Zealand is a sign of a direction that is not going heavenward. Right? But God says there is hope. What can change even the LGBTQ movement to become washed and sanctified? What is the key to transformation of the gender issues that are so sensitive? What is the key? Because Paul says the people in his day were wrestling with those issues. But somehow they gained the victory. They were washed. They were sanctified. They were justified. How? Through Christ, through love, you will never, and I say this boldly, you will never give up something you love for someone you do not love. You will not. The reason people are failing to repent, myself included, our struggles when it comes to especially the LGBTQ movement, right, is because they do not appreciate the value of the gift of Christ. That is what it is, because we all have to repent, regardless of who you are and what your struggle is. And true love has the power, as we read before, to change anything, Any. There is the hope right there. There is power and love to break any addiction. Now listen to this. From a worldly point of view, money is power. But from a Christian point of view, love is power. Love is power. Intellectual and spiritual strength are involved in this principle. Pure love has special efficacy to do good and can do nothing but good. It prevents discord and misery and brings the true happiness. I've got three slides that are relating to the challenges of youth today. With worldly use, the, we youth, the love of society and pleasure becomes an absorbing passion to dress, to visit, to indulge the appetites and passions, to whirl through the round of social dissipation appear to be the great 
end of existence, the great goal of life. They are unhappy if left in solitude. Their chief desire is to be admired and flattered and to make a sensation in society. And when this desire is not gratified, life seems unendurable. Hmm? But our homes, parents, our homes should be a place of refuge for the tempted youth. Why are children leaving the churches? Why are they moving out of homes early? Because they have found something better than what they have. The new covenant is something better. If home is what it should be, they will not go because it is better than what the world has to offer. It will be an unresistible attraction. Many they are who stand at the parting of the ways. Every influence, every impression is determining the choice that shapes their destiny, both here and hereafter. Evil invites them, and that's us. You know it. That's us. Evil invites them. It results, its results are many, are made bright and attractive. They have a welcome for every comer. All about us are youth who have no home, and many whose homes have no helpful, uplifting power. And the youth drift into evil. They are going down to ruin within the very shadow of our doors. These youth need a hand stretched out to them in sympathy. Kind words simply spoken, little attention simply bestowed, will sweep away the clouds of temptations which gather over the soul. The true expression of heaven-born sympathy has power to open the door of hearts that need the fragrance of Christ-like words and the simple, delicate touch of the spirit of Christ's love. If we would show an interest in the youth in the church, we, the mother, the bride of Christ, if we would show an interest in the youth, invite them to our homes and surround them with cheering, helpful influences, there are many who would gladly turn their steps into the upward path. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? I want to ask you today, individually, because I really believe that as much as we need food, we need more of love. And I want to ask you, what is your daily source of love? And I just want to ask a few people who are willing to be honest. What is your daily source of love? How often do you eat? Every day. More. <laughs> She's honest. She's like, all the time. Even more than once a day. What is your daily source of love? Be honest, somebody. What is your daily source of love? Reading the Bible, fantastic. What is your daily source of love? Someone young. Internet, thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. This is really getting to the heart of the issue and we will not get answers unless we're being honest. What is your daily source of love? Maybe someone older. What is your daily source of love? Seeing to the household. Seeing to the household. Mm. What is your daily source of love? Come on. This shouldn't be hard for you to think about. It's the life of Jesus. Thank you. What is your daily source of love? Think about it. The Bible says life is more than food. So you need this more than you need food. What is your daily source of love, brothers and sisters? What is it? Somebody else, tell me. What is your daily source? Laughter. Laughter, yes, yes. What's your daily source of love? Praying, good. Companionship, yes. The reason I'm asking you this is because if you think about the way you spend your time 
and where you are drawn to, it's normally a reflection of where the heart is at. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I'm, gar- I'm telling you, for many of us, because there are two great laws that we need. Love for God and from God, and love for man and from man is a daily need for every person. It is not good for Adam to be alone. Even the single man who is not married needs love from his family. That's why there is no one without parents. You came from somewhere because God knew even if you decided not to be married, you had a source of love. I want you to think about this because the biggest issue in the church is people are leaving because they find no it's, that's being honest. People are leaving home and going to seek love from boyfriends and pleasure places because they are looking for, for love. Many times people don't recognize their need, right? They're so hungry for love that they're out there binging on junk food. And I mean in a spiritual sense because they don't recognize what they need. They don't recognize what they need. What does that look like for you, for your daily source of love? What does it look like? Does it look like kind words? Does it look like hugs, affection? Is that what it looks like? Parents, your children, where are they getting their love from? And when I say love, I'm challenging us that are we just satisfied with giving them food and clothes and shelter? If that is what we are putting up against the devil, we are going to, to lose. Because the devil can put up food, clothes, and shelter anywhere. We have to put into our children Love of the highest order, Christ's love, because that can overcome the devil. If we are not doing this, parents, we are going to lose. I'm telling you, we are going to lose. I want to read John 15 as I come to a close. You know, the reason people love love songs, I was writing a list of love songs, you know, that are just so famous, is because it's a source of love for them. It speaks words of love into them. And whether it's Beyonce or Lionel Richie or whatever it is they're listening to, it is speaking love into them. That's why it's so unresistibly attractive, because they're hungry for love and they are getting it from those sources because home is not feeding it. I'm in John, and I'm going to bring this to a close. John chapter 15. I hope you don't underestimate what I am saying, because we know all about love, don't we? We know all about it. John chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 9. Jesus had said prior to this that I have food that you do not know of, right? That there is food that he offers his people that the world does not know of. This food makes you not hunger. This food makes you not thirst. What food is that? What food is that? that can satisfy one where they will not hunger nor thirst. They are content. The the power of the world is broken. What is that food that makes them not hunger? It says in John 15, verse 9, as the Father has... Somebody tell me, what did Jesus need in order to stay strong? He needed love from his father. Do you see that? His supply of love was full. He drew from God. 
and he was able to do what as a result based in that verse? He was able to love his disciples because he was loved by his father. And if we truly receive, respond to the love that God is giving, that God has given, we will be able, parents, to truly love our children. And our children will be able to love and extend that love into society to their friends. Jesus needed love. He needed love. And from that, then comes verse 10, obedience. And without that, there will be no fulfilling of the law. You will not do it. If you keep my commandments, then you will abide in my love. That ability to do so comes from verse 9. Even as I have kept my father's, father's commandment and abide in his love. So we receive the love and then obedience from love keeps us in the love. These things I have spoken to you that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. Brothers and sisters, we have to stop and be honest with ourselves. The world tells us, just be yourself. Just be yourself. But the reality is, is being yourself truly loving, kind, gentle? Is that who you of your own self are? Or do we need to be a new creation? Do we need to receive the love of Christ? Because just being myself, I can guarantee you, is not going to cut it. I have to become a new creation. I need to be born again to receive the love of Christ so that for those of us that want to know what, what Jesus came down to demonstrate, and this was one of our, our well moments with Natham, and I'm going to close on this. Christ came to demonstrate that what a poor man, what a what? What a poor man can do with love has more power to change the world than what an entire nation can do with legions of armies. I'm going to say that again. What a poor man can do with love has more power to change the world than what an entire nation can do with legions of armies. Jesus is still changing the world today. And Trump, Napoleon, Charlemagne, Caesar are still battling time after time to bring about change. And Christ continues to gain the victory. This is not a lukewarm gospel. This is the gospel. All our prophecies, if we do not get back to the basics of love, will end up in nothing. So I want to challenge you that God wants us to be born again, to receive his love to be a new creation. That's the challenge from God. That's the offer. And if that's your desire today, we're going to pray. We're going to pray if that's your desire. You can just put up your hand. I believe this is the point of failure of our families. We are filled with intellectuals. We want our children to graduate. But in the school of love, we are getting Fs. 
This is the point of failure. So we're going to pray. I just want you to put up your hand and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for us to have a conversion experience. That we may recognize that Christianity is about love. If we do not have love, we do not have God. For God is love. And he that loveth not knoweth not God. We're going to pray. Father in heaven, you see our desperate need to be born again, to be renewed, O Lord, to be created anew. You see our desperate need, O Lord. And Father, from whence shall we find love? What is the source? Lord, we can only love because you have first loved us. If we receive your love, that demonstration in Christ laying down his life for us who were his enemies. If we can receive, grab hold of that by faith, we shall have the victory that overcomes the world. Heavenly Father, we ask for each one here, Lord, that you may pour out your spirit upon First and foremost, Lord, the heads of the homes, the mothers and the fathers. Give us love in our hearts, O oh Lord. Give us courage to be honest, to be open. O oh Lord, for you are seeking from us a godly seed. And we pray, Father, as a church, for all those that come here seeking for love. Many of us do. Father, that we might truly receive your love, that we might have love to impart on your behalf. We ask this, Lord, truly in Jesus' name. Amen.